Hold on, hold on. Welcome, welcome everyone to the Holy Sparks podcast. My name is Saul K. As you know, our mission is to illuminate the brightest lights in the Jewish world and beyond so that we elevate the Holy Sparks within us and make the world around us a better place. And our guest today, I'm so excited, a very good friend of mine, is Rabbi Joe Black. Now, a little bit about Rabbi Joe. Uh, Rabbi Joe has served as the senior rabbi of Temple Emanuel in Denver, Colorado, since July 2010, previously serving as rabbi of Congregation Albert in Albuquerque, New Mexico, from 1996 to 2010. He served as assistant and then associate rabbi at Temple Israel in Minneapolis, Minnesota, from 1987 to 1996. He received his bachelor's degree in education from Northwestern University in 1982 and his master's degree and rabbinic ordination from the Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion, H-U-C-J-I-R, in 1987. In 2012, he received an honorary doctorate of divinity from H-U-C-J-I-R. Rabbi Black serves as the chaplain in the Colorado House of Representatives and is past president of the Rocky Mountain Rabbinical Council. An award-winning songwriter and nationally recognized musician, he has recorded seven albums of original Jewish music and published two songbooks. He is also an accomplished writer and poet. Rabbi Black has published several poems and articles in leading national literary and academic journals. He has been honored by American Songwriter Magazine for his music. He is a frequent contributor to anthologies and collections of Jewish writing. He has recorded seven critically acclaimed albums of original music, a songbook, <clears throat> and two children's books. Oh, excuse me, two videos. Two of his songs, Boker Tove and the Afikoman Mambo, have been made into children's book and distributed by the PJ Library. His most recent book, There Once Was a Man from Canaan, The Five Books of Limerick, is a collection of limericks based on each Torah portion. This past September, he released two new albums of original music, Praying With Our Feet, a collection of Jewish and spiritual songs, and Wire and Wood, his first foray into secular recording. He has performed his original music in many communities around the world and has received numerous honors for his performance and composition. As a musician, Rabbi Black is known for his guitar virtuosity, soaring voice, and lyrics that are at the same time funny, inspirational, and thought-provoking. His music is an extension of his rabbinate. So ladies and gentlemen, let's give a warm welcome to Rabbi Joe Black. Oh, let's go. Let's go. Louder in the back. In the back. Let's go. Let's hear you. That's how we do it. That's how we do it. <laughs> All right. Welcome, Rabbi Joe. How are Thousands you? Thousands of people in your audience are remarkable, so. We're huge. We are <laughs> huge. So thank you so much for spending some time with us. Uh, I'm, you know, happy to call you my friend. We have a long history together of traveling and playing all over the world, which we'll get into. Mm -hmm. But for those of uh, my audience that don't know who you are, let's kind of take it from the top. Why don't you start a little bit about, you know, your early life, how you grew up and kind of the early years of your Jewish life? Sure. Well, it's good to see you, my friend. Um, I grew up in Chicago, actually Evanston, Illinois. Anybody from Chicago would know that you, you don't say Chicago when you're talking about Evanston. Um, I uh, was active in my synagogue. I went to summer camp at uh, Asrui Olin Sang Ruby. Uh, when I was uh, 15 years old, I spent half a year in Israel on a program that was then called EIE, the Eisendrath International Exchange, which was six months, basically living in Israel uh, with an Israeli family. Uh, that's where I caught a love of both Hebrew and the state of Israel, and I'm a Zionist to this day. Uh, and my Jewish identity really was forged in my home, in my synagogue at summer camp. Um, when I uh, came back from Israel, I started um, teaching music and singing, and, and I was a cantoral soloist in many synagogues in the Chicago area. So I stayed in Chicago, went to Northwestern University. And um, while I was in college, I got a job hosting a television program in Chicago called The Magic Door. Anyone who was of a certain age who grew up in Chicago, uh, I played the role of Tiny Tove, which was an elf. I was I wore green tights and lived in an acorn in the town of Toraville, talked to puppets. I did that for three years. I was the fourth and last Tiny Tove. 
we won an Emmy Award, a uh, local Emmy for that. It was, it was a great experience. Also, when I was uh, in, at Northwestern, I was playing in clubs and doing all kinds of music. So I actually took a year off just to see if I wanted to be a full-time musician. And I decided I didn't. I loved it. I loved music, but I missed the intellectual and the academic uh, stimulation of, of, the, of studying, of teaching. And so then I thought, what do I want to do with my life? And I decided that the rabbinate was a perfect way for me to combine everything I love to do, uh, teaching, sharing Judaism. I could also do music. And it's I've been very, very fortunate these past 37 plus years that I've been blessed to be a rabbi in Israel. Amazing. So that's my career. Well, I can't get over this image of you in green tights. So if there's I have a picture somewhere, I, wait a minute, I have a picture somewhere. Okay. If you can find um, it, uh, we would definitely yeah. want to see it. <laughs> All right, I don't know if we do want to Here, see it. I don't know if you can see this. If you listen this to the podcast. Cast. Oh my magic door. Look at that. Look at that. And if you, Fran Moss, who's there next to me, Fran Moss, uh, is, is another uh, dear friend to this day who's also involved in the Jewish music world. So, Amazing. Okay, so so you kind of answered several questions at once, but, you know, one of the questions I really wanted to ask you about since you're, you know, so talented musically, number one, who are your early musical influences? And then let's let's pause there, and then I have another question for you. Sure. Um, well, um, growing up in Chicago, uh, in the midst of the, the folk boom in Chicago, there was a lot of local musicians, people like, Steve Goodman, a brilliant singer-songwriter who was taken from us way too soon. John Prine, of course. Um, people like Bonnie Kolak, uh, Jim Post, who just recently passed away. These are all wonderful local Chicago-based, but they toured nationally as well. A singer-songwriter, folk musicians. Uh, and then, of course, people like James Taylor, uh, Harry Chapin, Jim Croce. But also people like Jimi Hendrix, and you know, I also grew up in the Chicago blues scene, as I know you're into. So, Muddy Waters. Um, I would, I would. I'm thinking of other Chicago blues, Lonnie Brooks, just you know, other Coco Taylor. I, I grew up with with multiple influences, which I think uh, this made me is kind of well rounded. I love it. So both kind of local, really more folk based songwriting, yeah. and then of course blues and electric and. Course. And, you know, then going to going to do a summer camp, Debbie Friedman was my camp counselor um, oh. in 1971, you know, so and Debbie actually gave me my first gig uh, performing in a club when I came back from Israel. She was the uh, for a short period of time based out of Chicago. She was the uh, she worked for the Hillel's in Chicago and they had a, a little club called Elijah's Cup. And that was actually my first ever job performing was Debbie gave me and you know, we knew each other forever and, and her loss was a huge blow to me, obviously, both personally, spiritually and professionally as well. Amazing. So Elijah's Cup was a Jewish nightclub? Jewish. It was a Jewish coffee house oh. that was sponsored for a brief time by uh, the uh, Chicago Jewish Federation in Hillel's. And, you know, local Jewish musicians um, would would perform there. And sometimes uh, I saw Shlomo Karlbach there. I saw... Uh, I don't know if David Broza ever came through. I think he did. But when, when they weren't having bigger acts, they would have local people. And I was literally just a 15-year-old kid. And, and But I knew Debbie, and she invited me to come and, and play. It was great. Amazing. I love that. I think we should, we should, we should open up another one. Um, mm -hmm. Some Elijah would be psyched, psyched about it for mm -hmm. sure. Um, okay, question. This was yeah. something really deep that you said that uh, most people might have missed just because it was so quick. So you said you contemplated becoming a professional musician, but then really intellectually, academically, for those reasons, you decided eh, maybe this isn't enough for me. And I spiritually to too. Yeah. So you you want to talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. I mean, I, look, in the year off that I took, it was just a year. I mean, it wasn't, but I was, you know, I was teaching. I was uh, working as a cantoral soloist. I had my TV show, but I was also playing clubs. I was, you know, I had to put a little band together. We played bowling alleys and ground rounds and coffee houses and you know, from Green Bay, Wisconsin, up to Indiana. Um, I also had a singing group um, that was amazing. Uh, this is actually, I went back, but with uh, Steve Cantor, Steve Scherer of Blessed Memory, and Cantor Ricky Lippitz, we had a group called the Jerusalem Trio. If you go on YouTube, you can find some of our early work when I was like 18 or 19. We did this, we were incredible. Uh, and it was great. I mean, we were very good. Um, you know, what? Acapella or with instruments? No, no, it was instruments, uh, guitars, flute, percussion, but great harmonies. Um, 
there's a, a YouTube video of, uh, you should look it up. It's of uh, Steve Scherer who wrote Do Di Lee. Do Di Lee, Van, the three of us singing it together and, and several other pieces that, that are just, they were, we played a lot of Israeli music, not a lot of original at that time, except for Steve's stuff, um, but that was great. But what I, what I found, and I think anyone out there who's a professional musician will know, you in particular, that when you're a professional musician, you're always looking for the next gig and you're always thinking about what comes next. And I just didn't have the cheshek or the drive at that point in my life to really, uh, I mean, I could have, I think I could have, but That's I also idea. love being a rabbi. I, I feel really blessed that I'm a rabbi and I've been able to mold the two parts of my, my personality, my musical self, my rabbinic self, my Jewish teacher self. Uh, and, and I've been very, very blessed. Amazing. Yeah, I, I can completely relate to so much of that. At a certain point, you know, you realize as a musician playing in clubs and bars, your job is to sell booze. That's it. It actually doesn't matter what you play as long as they're in there buying. That's it. Yep. Yep. There's like a there's a moment when you realize that that's like, is this all that I've, you know, incarnated to do or is there more? And obviously yeah. you chose the yeah. more, which is great. Yeah. Um, so I have a question for you. It sounds like pretty early you were doing cantorial soloist gigs and leading and that sort of thing and in the mm -hmm. camp world. And was there a particular person or a moment when you made that decision? You know, this music isn't just isn't enough. Was there a person that inspired you to become a rabbi or was there really a kind of a quintessential moment where you said, aha, this is where I'm going? I don't think it was one person. I think it was many. Um, certainly Debbie, all the song leaders at camp that I knew, my camp counselors, um, the rabbis. My rabbi was David Polish, Shalom Shalom, a brilliant orator, teacher, writer. Not the most warm and personable guy, but he inspired me. He he was able to, whenever he would, we, my, we went every Shabbat. My family was very involved in the synagogue. Mm -hmm. um, my father was... Um, a uh, a scholar he spoke hebrew fluently he had a beautiful voice he, he actually should have been a cantor um mm -hmm. i think uh, in many ways uh his business was never his thing he was most happy when he was at, at shul um but so when i was at camp i met all kinds of uh, inspiring rabbis and teachers you know rabbi gary zola who was uh was just retiring from the Hebrew Union College as the director of the American Jewish Archives. Gary was my camp counselor. So Gary always, he was encouraging me, he recruited me. Also Sam Joseph, who was the, who just also retired from HUC at the time was the director of admissions. So there are a lot of people who steered me. Um, and I, I, but it really was sort of this process of, you know, what do I wanna do with my life? I wanna teach, I wanna share my love of Judaism. Um, I want to inspire people. I also want to be able to do my music. I didn't know if I'd be able to do music as a rabbi because there really, there weren't a lot of singing musical rabbis at the time. I was one of the, the early ones, mm -hmm. but um, I, I was very, very fortunate in that I, I, was, I was guided and encouraged by many uh, wonderful mentors and teachers in my life. I love it. And so growing up, did you grow up in the reform movement? Maybe. Yes, and um, I did, but my, my father grew up Orthodox, so we had sort of this uh, mixed, I went to an Orthodox day school for a while, we, we sort of went in and out of keeping Kashrut, we created an alternative minion at, at my synagogue, Beth Emmett in Evanston, my father and a few other people, it was basically a traditional minion, but it was uh, with women and men together and music, and I started playing guitar actually there too, um, playing for services, that's another place. So every Shabbat morning, I'd have to like learn the prayers and learn how to daven. And that was also a big piece of it for me as well. So yes, we were part of the reform movement, but I know, and right now my sister is Orthodox. My nephew is an Orthodox rabbi, brilliant, wonderful, uh, progressive uh, uh, role model for me. And he's much younger than I, this is my nephew, but yeah. I love it. Okay. And so, which leads to my next question, which is, why did you choose the reform movement to align with in terms of your own smicha and rabbinate? It's what I knew. You know, I grew up going to going to reform synagogue, the reform movement. I was a product of Nifty. Um, 
So, and, and also the synagogue in which we grew up is really a, a unique place, Beth Emmett. It was, it was very traditional in terms of the, the amount, I mean, Hebrew, look, they sent every year, they would send two or three students to Israel to study. So the Hebrew language, we, I had Hebrew as my language in high school. So I was fairly literate and my father was fluent and studied Torah every Shabbat with a group of, you know, a chevruta. So that was my role model. So that wasn't alien to me. That, I mean, it's, it's funny because when I went to HUC and I started getting involved, and Economark also, Olin Sang, was very traditional. There was a lot of, you know, people like Joel Grishaver was my camp counselor and my mentor, who was the founder of Torah Ora um, uh, Publishing. So a lot of people who had a love for and an awareness of Orthodox Judaism, and I was too. So, but to me, it was a, it was not a difficult combination at the time. Um, then I've been able to forge my own path. I love it. I love it. So, you know, for people that, uh, might not be familiar with what is life like? What is a typical month or week like as a senior rabbi, if that such a thing exists? Mm. But, you know, one of the reasons why I'm doing this podcast is because there's a lot of people that are looking at, is this a career path for me? You know, yeah. what does it look like when I'm there? Right? Because it's hard to see it until you're there and every show sure. is different, of course. But, you know, if you can map out kind of a, a usual month or week for you, that would be really helpful. I mean, one, yes and no, I can't, I can and I can't. So every day is unique. Like, so today, for example, I start out the day, I give an opening prayer at the, at the Colorado House of Representatives. Then I had to catch up on correspondence and make a few phone calls. I have this podcast. That's not usual. I don't do a podcast every day, but um, I, I meet with B'nai Mitzvah kids. I, uh, we're in the midst of a major fundraising campaign right now for our synagogue. So I do a lot of lunches with big donors. Um, I, I did three funerals last week. Um, I have two B'nai Mitzvah this weekend. I have a wedding on tomorrow morning. Um, and so, um, and every day is different. Literally every day is different. Yes, and I have a lot of meetings with staff. We have a, we're a large congregation of about 2000 households. We have a big staff. So um, I have to make sure that everyone is um, on task and that we're working in partnership. And, you know, I try to create, I, I wouldn't, I don't take full responsibility for this, but we have a really wonderful team, which are is then comprised of other teams of, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit of a corporation. So you have to have a sense of organization and leadership. And that's not my greatest strength, but I have people around me who, who it is their greatest strength. So I try and hire the kind of people whose strengths are my weaknesses and who I can work well with and create a sense of synergy. We're a very musical congregation. So we do a lot of music. Uh, we have three, we, I have a, a, an amazing cantor and cantor Elizabeth Sachs. She's our senior cantor. And then Steve Brodsky, who I don't know if will be on your podcast. He should be. He's a, a wonderful singer songwriter of himself. He and his group Sababa and Steve was the head of Sounds Right Music and URJ Music. Uh, so we have a wonderful musical team. And you know, you've been here. We've we've played together. So we do a lot of music together. Each day is different. And I go to the hospitals. I visit people in the hospital. I counsel people. Um, celebrations, baby namings. So each day is unique. And sometimes it's exhausting. Sometimes it's exhausting. But what I'll say, what I love most about being a rabbi is that every day, no matter what I've been through, I've done one thing at least uh, for the sake of tikkun, making it a little bit better. It may be just a phone call. It may be a counseling session. It may be a life cycle event. But no matter what I'm dealing with, I've done one thing that's made the world a better place. Um, I also like the fact that each day is, I have no idea what's going to confront me. I have a schedule, but if there's an emergency or if there's a simcha, I'm, I'm there. I get to share the highest moments with my congregants, some of the most difficult moments with my congregants and my community. Um, yesterday, I testified on behalf of a law in front of the legislature on uh, abortion access that I felt was very important. I feel compelled about. So uh, I am a public figure. I am, I, I can, if I want to get involved in issues that I think not politically, but morally are important. Um, I write a lot. I, I, I'm, you know, I, it's, my congregation wants me to study. So I, I, I am, I have to carve out time for that. And of course I want to carve out time for my family and my friends and my music. So uh, I'm very, very busy all the time. And I love it. I love it. Wow. That's a great picture of the buffet of possibilities as a senior rabbi. I like to think yeah. of 
I'll say. Okay, so you alluded to something, but this is this is also a, a natural next question. What do you feel is the most challenging part of of the work that you do? I think there's there's three parts to that. I can't give just one. One is you know the the you're never done. I wrote a song a few years ago called "Leave a Little Bit Undone." Because I can't finish it. It's impossible to finish everything. You, that, but I, I guess God never finished either, right? So we say, yom tamnid God renews every day the work of creation. It, it continues, and it is, it is, and, and the problem is if you if you can't come to terms with that, if you're someone who has to finish everything all the time, it's going to be hard. So that's one. Um, two, there's a lot of politics, synagogue politics. I don't like meetings. I don't like, but. I also understand that they're important because a it gets people involved, and b that's how we get things done. Um, and you know, dealing with difficult being with with the bedside of someone who's dying, or comforting a family that's lost a loved one, that's on the one hand it's really hard. On the other hand, it is one of the most rewarding things that I do because I know I made a difference in their lives. Mm -hmm. So to the point of leaving things undone for people that like details. What's a good example of that? Beside, well, I don't want to give, I don't want to prompt you, but what's a good example of, you know, the work's never done. Okay, so, for example, well, it's job security, right? Um, <laughs> well, I'll use the example of of a of a, a loss, a death. Mm -hmm. You know, I can be there with a family. I can do the funeral. I can write a brilliant eulogy. I can help them, but that's not done because they're still going to be dealing with the grief. So I have to follow up and make sure things are done. Um, counseling. There's a young man with whom I'm working right now who's going through drug rehab and uh, wants to talk about God. And so I'm never going to answer that. Uh, the, um, there's always going to be another challenge. There's always going to be something else that comes up. Um, and you can't, the other thing I've learned is that there's no way possible that I can please everyone in my congregation. I don't try. <clears throat> now, I've been doing this for a long time. I'm towards the end of my career. I've got a few more years, but, um, you know, there will always be 20% of the congregation. This is something I've learned. 20% of the congregation will love everything I do, no matter what it is. 20% of the congregation will hate everything I do, no matter what it is. Uh, and that other 60% is who we have to really work on. Um, and people play out their family issues in synagogues all the time, whether it's at board board meetings or in one on one. You know, if I get a bizarre response from someone, I'm saying, why is this person so angry? And then I say, oh, there might be other issues in the family that are going on. So that, that type of thing. And you just learn that over the years. It's not something they teach you necessarily in rabbinical school. But, you know, I see one of my roles also is mentoring other rabbis. I've been blessed. I've been able to help other young rabbis begin their careers and foster their careers. And that's one of the most rewarding things that I think I can do. Mm, I love it. Yeah, I love it. So much good stuff so far. Mm -hmm. Well, talk to us a little bit about what you're working on these days, what you're promoting and, and you know, share with us, you know, you're such a creative person. Musically. Yeah, what's happening? Well, um, as you said, so in, in the wonderful bio that I gave you, <laughs> um, I just released two albums of original music. Um, and, and uh, you know, why two and why? And one of them is Jewish and one of them is not. Well, it was 18 years since the last time I was able to do this. I, you know, I started this, this new position. It's not so new, 13 years ago, I was in Albuquerque for 14 years. And while in Albuquerque, I wrote a lot and I recorded two albums. Um, and I had a lot more time there because it was a smaller congregation. Here, I don't have as much time. So my leadership and their wisdom gave me three months of sabbatical, not all at once, one month at a time over three years. So the first one was just before COVID hit. And then the next one was last year, two years ago. No, last, last year. Uh, and I had I've been writing songs continuously and I've been, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the process of writing later on, but uh, I've been working a lot on the prog process and the artistry of, of songwriting. So I had uh, both Jewish and non-Jewish. So I had 18, at least, I had like 40 songs. Out of that, um, we chose 26, mm -hmm. um, 13 in each. It's just remarkable. And I recorded them with a friend of mine, Scott Leader, who's a great producer in Scottsdale, Arizona. And I did a, a, a crowdfunding campaign 
to help pay for it because I'm not going to be on tour and people don't buy music anymore, as we well know. So uh, luckily, I was able to do that and um, recorded these two albums. And I've been performing them in different places here in Denver, a little bit around the country. I just was with you, actually, uh, and during my last piece of my sabbatical uh, last January. But so I recorded these two albums and I'm very, very happy with them. I'm really excited about them. Watch play something off one of them. Oh sure. Um, oh, let's see. I'm gonna play a sad song. So I'm gonna play so you can see my fingers because people don't want to watch them. This is a song about my mother. My mother was born in uh, 1926 in Leipzig, Germany. And in the age of uh, 12 years old, she and her parents lived through Kristallnacht, the night of the broken glass, November 9th, 1938. And then in December, December 30th of 1938, one month later, a little bit more than a month, they left Germany and came to America. And this is a song I wrote about her. It's called The Salty Taste of Tears. a refugee with glass in her shoes, 12 years old, scared and confused, peeking through the curtains at American Jews who never walk in fear. Dread that lived within her bones was birthed on ancient cobblestones, repossessed abandoned homes, a salty taste of tears. That kept her up at night were vague and undefined. Boulevards where yellow stars march lockstep in straight lines. Consonants and syllables she had left behind. Smoke that never clears. A salty taste of tears. She minded all her P's and Q's As if compliance could undo The past two thousand years She cataloged and turned the pages A lifetime filled with different stages Learning lessons of the ages The salty taste of tears Dreams that kept her up at night Vague and undefined Boulevards where yellow stars march lockstep in straight lines. Consonants and syllables she had left behind. Smoke that never clears. A salty taste of tears. She lived her life as if someday. Fragile fears might go away. She knew God's grace just couldn't stay. It always disappears. Oh, no. All my life I've tried to see, understand her legacy. She is now bequeathed to me with the salty taste of tears. in her shoes, 12 years old, scared and confused, peeking through the curtains at American Jews who never walked in fear. Beautiful. Thanks. I love that tune. I love that tune. So, <coughs> excuse me, but for the songwriters listening or people that are interested in that part of the yeah. show, why don't you talk a little bit about your songwriting process? Totally. Um, both, it'd be fascinating to see if there's difference between, you know, the Jewish liturgical stuff and the secular. Talk 
a little bit about that. Um, it has evolved a lot over the last several years. Um, I started taking, well, I mean, I've been writing songs since I was 10, right? So, and I started out writing children's music when my kids were little. And actually it was a request of um, my synagogue in Minneapolis, Temple Israel. They asked if I would do a concert for our nursery school. So I said, okay, I'm gonna write some songs. So I wrote a song called the Aleph Bet Boogie. I wrote a song called Judah Maccabee, which is probably my best known Hanukkah song. Uh, and a few others, and that's, and then uh, they asked if I would record a cassette, and I recorded the cassette, and back in the day, a cassette, by the way, is this little thing about that big, used to stick into a cassette player, anyway, um, and I, then I, I was approached by someone who said, we'd like to produce an album of yours, and so it became the Alphabet Boogie, and, but I, I started with kids' music, um, but as I grew, and, and I, I've always been a poet, I've always been a writer, um, I started to uh, look at ways to convey important ideas, uh, important uh, teachings within Judaism. And um, they kind of evolved into lyrics, into, I mean, I, 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 it, it wasn't a thoughtful process. It was sort of, I mean, it, it sort of evolved naturally. But lately I've been looking at the craft and you know, how you write, how you look at meter, how you look at rhythm, how you look at how things scan. Um, what is a chorus? What's a pre-chorus? What's a bridge? Um, what are the rhymes that I'm using? How are they cliche? Are they are they unique? Um, does it have to be a perfect rhyme? Um, th things like, um, what's the voice that I'm speaking in? Am I speaking in the third person? Am I speaking in the second person? Am I speaking in the first person? And each of the, sometimes I'll write a song in three different voices. I'll do it first, second, and third person, see how that feels. And um, I started going to this uh, songwriting uh, workshop every summer in Lyons, Colorado called uh, Song School, which is, it's changed my life. I was teach. I I studied with a faculty from Berkeley College. I've studied with many amazing musicians, performers, singer songwriters, and I really feel that I've been able to take my music up a, a, to a whole new level that I have met. I didn't know before. So whereas I used to focus mostly on music, I focus a lot more now on lyrics. Um, so, but but you know, again, as you will attest, Saul, sometimes a song will come to you fully formed as a gift, and sometimes you'll every single syllable and every single meter and pattern and rhyming pattern you will agonize over for weeks. I mean, there's songs that I've, I haven't finished. I've been writing for years and others that came like that song I just wrote, that I just sang that came almost spontaneously mm -hmm. um, because it came from my neshama, you know, my soul. Uh, I hope to teach a course this summer at a uh, song school in Lyons called the spirituality of, of songwriting and, and talk about where do our ideas come from and how do we get tuned into that, that muse, that source, that holiness that emerges, no matter what kind of song it is. You know, if, if it if I feel like I need to cry, I mean, it took me a long time to be able to sing that song I just did uh, in public because I couldn't get through it without breaking down. Um, or if I feel it's funny or the, the hair on the back of my neck stands up or whatever it might be, then I know I've hit something and there's a whole, it's not just intellectual, it's it's part of, it, comes, it has to come from your soul. Um, so I, I spend a lot of time now really working on the craft. And part of that is just woodshedding. You know, I, when I had COVID uh, this past January during my sabbatical, I saw you just after, uh, uh, I was not contagious when I saw you. Um, I, uh, I wrote, I think 14 songs in like a song a day. Um, and I forced myself to, and of those 14, two of them were okay. You know, and uh, one of my teachers uh, at song school, a guy named Pat Patterson, who really, um, who wrote, literally the book, the book on writing lyrics says, I encourage you to write crap. He didn't say crap, but I'll say it for the sake of this podcast that uh, write a lot of crap because crap is the best fertilizer. So even a song that's not very good, there might be one rhyme or one chord progression or one word that, or one phrase or idiom, you know what? And I think songs should tell stories. Uh, and I'm spending a lot of time crafting that and you know i've been i've been very fortunate because I, i've been getting some national recognition i won twice i've submitted my lyrics to american songwriter magazine i won first prize one year and i won second prize second place another year another month not the whole year but um and and people are are singing my music and so it's it's nice and i feel very and you know for me one of the greatest honors is when someone else wants to sing your songs <laughs> 
for sure. You know, it's interesting that we share that uh, at Pat Pattison as a teacher. He was my lyric writing teacher at music school. Okay, he, at Berkeley, right? Yeah, the art of writing lyrics. And actually, we went to Nashville together on a thing with Pat. Yeah. Really, so the art of lyric writing, maybe he has subsequent books, but whatever content he has out there, if you really want to take your lyric writing to a whole nother level, and there are many other levels, you want to dive into his work. His, and, and it's, you know, he's, he's tough, you know, balanced and unbalanced. What is it? Balanced and unbalanced rhythm. Okay. And People would be scared to read their lyrics in front of him because he, he, he would tell it to you straight. Oh, totally. And he's done that for me. And, and I mean, he, I wouldn't say you had much more exposure to him, but than I did studying at Berkeley, but um just the the experience of looking at the craft of songwriting as a craft as a not just a a hobby it's a whole nother level yeah it's like uh dion warren would you know just write 40 hours a week like that's her job that was her yeah. craft, right so so for, <clears throat> for those of you you know song leaders that are aspiring to be songwriters you, you have to take it on, right? And so my question to you also, obviously you had a sabbatical, so you had a lot of time in your hands, but kind of during a normal month, do you carve out writing time or is it just catch as catch can? It really depends. I mean, I used to write on airplanes when I traveled a lot, that was the best because there's no phones. I mean, I, I have this whole collection of songs that I call airplane songs that are pretty good. Um, I try to carve out times, I take Mondays off and I try to spend at least two to three hours every Monday. You know, I'm, I also want to be with my wife. I want to be with my friends and my, my kids. Uh, I'm going to be a grandpa in July. I can't wait. This is very exciting. Our first grandchild is uh, due Baruch Hashem God July 7th. Uh, and our daughter Ilana is pregnant. And we're very excited about that. Um, so I want to carve out time for that. It's hard. It's hard. But sometimes you're called. I mean, when, when a song is as my wife Sue will tell you when I'm in the middle of writing a song, I can't talk to anybody because it has to come out. It's, it's, it's in some ways, I, I certainly don't want to compare it to giving birth. I have no idea what it's like to give birth. I will never in my life try to pretend that I know, but when there is a, something that has to come out of me, I, I can't, I can't not. And it drives my wife crazy, frankly, Sue, because, but you know, I'm sure anyone who's a songwriter or any kind of creative personality wants that it's there. It has to come out. I totally agree. Uh, I wrote a song day before yesterday. Mm. I know, I now know when one's coming. It's literally like I feel mentally and emotionally like the clouds come in and it's a very specific feeling. I'm like, Ooh, I need to sit down at the piano like now. And it might take a minute. It might take five. It might just that what two days ago it took three hours, but it just started pouring out and it was it was amazing so but Do you have a co-write i have yeah actually i co-wrote a tune with I mean, a bunch of people but with um uh, david swirsky of the moshav band uh, we did this l high together that it'll end up on one of their records uh, but i love co-writing let's do it let's do it okay you all heard it here first on the holy <laughs> you can make it to a co-write um i love it so we could definitely talk about songwriting for for hours and hours um but I also want you to share some of your, your lyr limericks because you're such a great writer and oh. something that that's current. And so perhaps you could give us something about Pesach or talk a little bit about your book. Um, yeah, this is, um, I wrote this book. There once was a man from Canaan, the five books of limerick. Um, I wrote a few years ago, basically on a dare. Um, I was then, I was in Albuquerque when I started doing this, my cantor dared me to Barbara Finn wonderful cantor, uh, dared me to write a limerick for every Torah portion. So I took her up on it. I posted them on Facebook. Um, and then I got a lot of positive responses from it. Uh, and, you know, I did it for like three years and I had oftentimes two or three or four for every Parsha. And so I went through them. I, I called the ones that I thought were best and I published this little book. So, uh, like here's Bray sheet. Um, just take a bite, said the snake. Who cares if a rule you might break? The fruit that you'll eat is so juicy and sweet. Think of the pies you can bake. You know, so so each and and this this the, the thing I love about limericks, which has also helped my songwriting, is that you are you are stuck to a form. You have to you know da 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 You know Billy Joel's song, The Piano Man. They're all limericks, all the verses. Da 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 da. 
You know, so I don't think these, um, anyway, so here's, uh, Noah, um, you know, the story of Noah, what's the first thing Noah does when he comes out of the ark? Yeah, he gets drunk. He plants a vineyard and gets drunk. And then, uh, uh, there was an, an embarrassing thing where he exposed himself to his children. So Noah uncouth and quite, quite gruff went out of the ark in a huff, but when Shem, Ham and Yafet saw him drunk in the buff, it truly was more than enough. <laughs> so good. Uh-huh. So, we're coming towards Pesach. Do you have a, like a Pesach themed or? Uh, yeah. So, um, Exodus. yeah, I'm looking at Exodus here. Um, uh, okay. Well, here's, uh, the plagues. Uh, this is, uh, Vaira. Moses shows what God will unveil to Pharaoh with great detail. The Nile River muddy will turn gross and bloody. Then come frogs, lice, flies, mange, boils, and hail. Nice. You know, the plagues. Mange. I'll, I'll do one more. Mange, yeah. Here's Tazria and Mitzora. Here's Tazria, if, which is the a, a Torah portion about um, being clean and unclean and leprosy. And Mitzora is about bodily fluids and bodily functions and grossness. Mm -hmm. So here's Tazria. If your skin is scaly and sore and is oozing with grossness and gore, you'll be labeled unclean till the priest intervenes and dunks you in water that's pure. I like that rhyme, gore, sore, and pure. And then when studying Parshat Mitzora, you learn to never ignore a peculiar emission or painful condition that's explained in detail in the Torah. So Ooh, yeah, go ask your if, rabbi about that parsha, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> if you're interested, you can send me an email, uh, Rabbi Joe Black at gmail.com and I can I'll give you a good deal. Okay. Awesome. So obviously people can find your books and your music on Amazon and every other way possible. Apple music and and so is there, uh, is there something besides general songwriting, is there something that you're working on specifically now creatively that's kind of upcoming? Um, just writing. I, I don't have a big project right now. I'm, you know, the problem is that while, while during a sabbatical, I have time, really, I don't have time to do a major project. I have millions of, I have books I want to write. I want to write a book on idolatry, um, and why it's such an, uh, an important, um, sin. I want to write a book on what I think is the essence of Judaism uh, in terms of Judaism was radically unique because of how it focused our relationship with God instead of our fear of God. Mm -hmm. um, and when I retire in a few years, that's probably what I'll do. And I'll still sing and write and perform. I love it. Okay. So for someone that's thinking about, you know, going on this route of becoming a congregational rabbi, let's leave denominations aside for a moment, but just in sure. general, the, the path, you know, what would you, what would you recommend to them and anything mm -hmm. that you would add in terms of something they should add to their journey or look out for, or look for? Great question. So I, I would recommend a, that they get involved with the synagogue or a, a or, or an organization that has rabbis so that they can get to know them. We love to mentor people. That's, you know, so if you want, if you have questions, come talk to one of us, you know, we're all, all of us are different. All of us have different rabbinate, but we all are here because we love and care about the Jewish people and the future of Judaism. So I would say, number one, the first and foremost is find yourself, you know, as it says in, in, uh, you know, either we translate that as when you find yourself a teacher, you have found a friend or find yourself a teacher and then get a friend as well. Um, the, or a, a, a chaver is more than just a friend. It's a partner, a chavruta, someone you can study with. I would say learn as much Hebrew as you can. It's really important. I would say study as much as you can before going to rabbinical school. And I would also, you know, I sat on the admissions committee when I was in rabbinical school. So we interviewed a lot of students. And the one thing that it was always important for me when I was looking is if someone said, the only thing I can possibly be in my life is a rabbi, that's not a healthy thing. Um, you should see a rabbi, something I'm considering, but have a 
know what else you could do if you didn't get accepted or if it wasn't right for you, you know, because people who are so focused only on that, I think is not necessarily healthy. Um, make sure you have a, a good social life. Make sure you have a good support system because it's hard, but it's, I love being a rabbi. I feel very fulfilled by it. I love being able to help people, but I also need a check on my ego. I also need a check on, on reality. It's really important because I, I do what I do. I think I'm good at it, but I'm easily replaceable as is anybody. And you should know that we're not God. Uh, and I think what, what happens is that rabbis often get caught up in believing that 20% who think that they can do no wrong or the other 20% thinks that they, they can do no right somewhere in the middle. Humility, I think is really important. There's a lot there. Yeah. A good friend of mine says humility will take you further than genius. Um, I love yeah. that. And you know, the, it's a question that came up in my last interview, which is there seems, I don't know if this is accurate or not in the reform movement, but there, at least this was, we were talking about conservative movement, but in reform, I don't know, you can tell me if this is true. If there seems like there's, there's less people coming into the field now, is that accurate or, or not? Yeah. If so, why well, do you think I, that? I, I, yes. And I think there are more options. Well, okay. A couple things. Um, number one, I think the traditional, um, seminary system no longer speaks to a lot of younger people. Mm -hmm. Um, being able to give up five years of your life. I, I, I spent, I picked up and I moved to Jerusalem for a year. Then I moved to Cincinnati, Ohio for four years. By the way, I loved Cincinnati. I'm, I'm very sad that they're closing the campus, but that's another discussion. But, um, and you know, it, it's, 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 exp and, and it's a lot more expensive now than it was. I, I emerged from rabbinical school with no debt at all. There are students who are coming up with six figures of debt. Um, I think the other thing people are seeing is that, you know, COVID really took a, a huge impact on rabbis um, and cantors and clergy and professionals of all kind. Um, and that there's a lot of burnout. A lot of people are leaving the, the field early and people have seen that. I think there are also other options. You know, when I would apply to rabbinical school, you applied to reform or conservative or reconstruction as if you weren't going to be an Orthodox rabbi. Now, through the renewal movement, there's Hebrew Teachers College, there's there's many different options. Some of them, I think, are more um, uh, legitimate, let's say, than others. I think, you know, there are the mail order ones that you can get in several months. I, I don't have as much um, respect for, let's put it that way. Although I know that there are people who are cantors and other Jewish professionals who are looking for the title rabbi to sort of give them more authority, which is sad to me, who are doing that route. Um, and some of them are quite qualified, but others are not. So that's a problem. Uh, but there, I think there are more options and less expensive options. I think um, HUC and JTS uh, and the Reconstruction of Rabbinical College and, and uh, you know, all the, all the main denominational seminaries are following the lead of places like Ohala, which is the renewal movement, who are saying you can do it remotely. Um, a lot of people are second career rabbis with families and they can't just uproot themselves. So our, our seminaries are really doing a lot of soul searching, asking the, the legitimate question, how do we create, a, I mean, I got an amazing education. I studied with incredible teachers. I feel very blessed. Um, can you do that in less than five years? Can you do that remotely without the, the community of support that I had that I loved? Um, it's a problem. But so I think it's a, it's a huge investment. I think people are questioning it. I think organized religion, which could be an oxymoron, but I'll, I'll keep saying it, um, is facing many different challenges. I see a lot of congregations and synagogues and, and organizations that don't have the depth and the, the, the roots that say, for example, our congregation, which is 2000 households, 150 years old, we can weather lots of storms. Smaller congregations can't. So I see a lot of the merging and, and folding. Um, I see a lot of anger being levied at clergy. So I think people are reticent and you need to go into it with your eyes open. And I think that our movements have to, and are starting to rise to the challenge of addressing a new generation and new revenue. But yes, the numbers are very, very small, very small. I mean, I, I heard somewhere that this year's entering class at the Hebrew Union College, all four campuses, all three campuses is less than 14 people. My class was 40. That was just Cincinnati. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's, but, but that says a lot because it's a great career opportunity. There will be jobs for anyone who wants to go. And it's a good living. I've made, I've made a very good living 
uh, and I don't, but it's not for everybody. I could have made a lot more money as a lawyer or a business person, but I would not have been as fulfilled. Or a successful songwriter, I don't know about that either, but that's a There's musician. Still time. There's still time. Yeah. Um, now there's so much there. I appreciate that your transparency around all that, and it, it's mm. a changing model for sure. I mean, it has yeah. to change, right? It has, to, yeah. it has to, to, to survive. And I also think that one thing that we're seeing is because of the, the tensions that all the movements are facing, we have to do a lot more collaboration. 100%. Between the reform, conservative, reconstructionists, and renewal movements, and others as well. 100%. Because uh, we're all in this together. Totally agree. Um, which l leads to my my final or perhaps penultimate question, which is, uh, what do you feel the Jewish world needs most now? Good question. Um, I think the Jewish world now needs to be able to be a little less intense. There's a lot that people are worried about, and we hear about a lot of worries about, and, and you know, doomsday um, in terms of the future of the Jewish people, the future of the state of Israel, the future of American Judaism, the infighting. Um, I, I, those are all real, but I think we also need to make Shabbos. We need to be able to just sit and take back and take stock in the beauty and the joy of our tradition, our prayers, our liturgy, our music, our sacred texts the incredible relationships we build when we pray together when we sing together when we study together uh, and focus that is really why we're doing this it's you know i think because we're, we're facing crises within movements and every movement right now is, is is radically changing and radically shrinking um we need to say okay that may be true but also look at what it is that we are gifted with look at the you know, 3,000 years of love and joy and holiness and tradition that God has given us, we need to just sort of taste that, savor it, uh, enjoy it, and then worry about the problems. And I think ultimately, you know, this is not the first time that the Jewish people have faced difficulties, nor will it be the last, and we've survived and we will continue to. Um, so I think that is probably things that, you know, looking at times of change are stressful, but they are also incredibly fruitful and, and opportunities for creativity as well. I love it. I love it. Focus on the fruits and not the birds. Yeah. Kind there's of. a there's a song, Focus on the Fruits. I like that. We can write that one together. Yeah. Uh, well, Rabbi Joe, I want to just thank you so much for your time and your wisdom. And of course, thank you, my dear friend. And, uh, you know, I know a lot of guitar playing rabbis, ladies and gentlemen, and he is one of the best for sure. One of the best. Hey, um, <laughs> we got to keep humble. We got to keep humble. <laughs> If you're a guitar player, I want you to listen to what his finger work for sure. And songwriters as well, of course, and singers. And, you know, really, you're doing some amazing things in the world. And and uh, I'm excited to hear, you know, the, the finishing this chapter of, of your life and then all of the offerings that will come when you move into the next phase. When... Not a while yet, but yeah. So anything, any last words you'd like to say to the, our Holy Sparks audience? Oh, and then one last thing, I'll ask you for a word of Torah. It could be about Pesach or this week's Parsha or anything you'd like to offer. It would be well received. Um, you know, Vayakel is this week's Parsha. And this, uh, this Shabbat is three years since we and every other congregation around the country closed down for COVID. And I'm trying to think what I'm going to say. And I'm literally just starting. I'm just starting to think about it. And I guess um, the word vayakil, it means, and, and Moses gathered together all the people, kihila. And one of the things that we've learned over the past three years is what does it mean to gather together, both physically, but also remotely. And every rabbi that I know has gained, and every Jewish professional, not just rabbis, cantors, educators, administrators, has had to pivot and learn how to adapt to new media like Zoom, for example, you know, the idea of doing this three years ago, Saul, would have been, what do I need to do? I got to talk on my computer. You're not going to be in the room with me. Um, and so what we've learned, but we've learned that there are many ways to come together. And so the process of creating a kihila vayakel, a sacred community, uh, is probably what I'm going to focus on this Shabbat. Um, that we can, we have learned that it's good to be together, but when we can't be together, we still need to connect. And 
when we connect, God's presence is felt. So that's probably what I'm going, that's the essence. I'll have to flesh that a little bit more, but the essence of what I'll speak about this Shabbat. I love it. Well, I want to bless you with a sweet Shabbat. Simcha, Shalom, Parnasa, Bashat Tova for your upcoming Zaydi status. We're all Yes, excited. thank you. And Sab- I'm going to be Saba, not Zaydi. That's Saba, amazing. okay, okay. Your upcoming Saba status. <laughs> and uh, we look forward to speaking with you soon. Thanks so much for tuning in, everybody.